Okay, so we're going to take now, and the GC looks like it's ready to go. So let's inject the calibration standard that we just made into the GC. The first time you puncture the septum, you need to support the syringe needle with your thumb and your forefinger so you don't bend the needle as you're forcing it through the septum for the first time. So you hold on like this and then you poke straight down and then you're in the calibration standard and you can pump the syringe. So we like to joke that you have to pump the syringe a thousand times. It's not really true, but you have to pump it many times to make sure that the syringe is cleaned out from anything that's been in there before and is completely filled with the new calibration standard. You'll notice that I'm pumping this syringe with one hand. This is hard for people that are new to this because it's easier for them to use two hands to support the syringe like this, but then you can't see what you're doing. So it's, it's useful to develop this chopstick technique so that you can see the plunger going up and down, up at eye level while you're doing it. So finally, when I'm happy that I've pumped enough, I'm gonna pull the plunger back to the one mark on the syringe and then pull it out. Then I'm gonna pull the plunger back to the four mark so that I can actually see the liquid in the syringe. Now, probably this is very hard to see on the video because it's hard to see for me right now being a foot away because you can see the liquid in the syringe because it kind of refracts the light differently and then I've pulled it back with air. So there's air from the tip of the needle here back to around here and then from that finger to that finger there's one and a half microliters. There's the one microliter we measured plus the half microliter that was in the the, the, back, the the needle. The needle has some volume, about a half a microliter. It's different from syringe to syringe. And also, I've pulled it back so that if I accidentally touch the plunger, I only lose a little bit of air. I don't lose any of the liquid that I've got trapped in there. So that's what it should look like every time. So here I'm ready now. I'm going to come over here, and I'm, I'm going to be careful not to go through the rubber septum, because if I do, then some of the molecules are going to escape into the GC. I'm just feeling for the rubber septum very gently, and then when I, when I know I'm there, I can just let the syringe hang like that. And then I take a quick look around, make sure everything looks good, and if I'm happy, I hit the start button first. Now that's important. It's important to hit the start button first before you push the syringe in, rather than the other way around. But you also don't want to wait too long. You want to be as consistent as possible between the time you hit the start button and actually pushing the syringe in and dispensing the contents. So it's going to take me a second or so, but here we go. I hit the start button all the way in, right up to the hilt, depress the plunger, and then pull it out. So that made the injection. It, it squirted the calibration standard that we made into the flowing stream of hydrogen, which is currently at 140 something degrees, and the molecules have evaporated and are being pushed by the hydrogen through the tube. So a tube like this, which is called a column, costs about $500. So they're not cheap, but they should last forever as long as you don't um, squirt too much junk in there. And certain things you wouldn't want to squirt in. You wouldn't want to squirt in blood or milk or um, gummy bear residue if you can avoid it, although you can measure gummy bear residue. It's, it's harder on the column than nice clean samples that don't have a lot of goo. So as the molecules move through the tube, some of the molecules go through a little faster than others. The, the solvent, the acetone, goes through almost immediately. You can see on the chromatogram, we call this picture of the graph of what happens to the chromatogram. The first thing that happens is there's this tremendously high spike. Well, that's the acetone arriving at the detector. So that happens right away, and then there's a gap before the next molecule which is going to be the methyl stearate, the palm oil. That's the next molecule that comes out of the column. And then it's followed by the CBD, the THC, the CBN, and really all the other cannabinoids that you'd want to measure come out at some point in that time scale. So right now, there's really nothing to do except wait, but we could take advantage of the time by preparing an actual sample. So let's find something to measure. So here's a, here's a sample that somebody kindly donated. It's Durban Poison. Now this could be a flower sample or it could be an oil sample, right? It could be a sample 
looks like looks like this, right? Some kind of a some kind of a of a condensed high potency oil. I really almost have to heat this. It's it's almost a solid, so it's going to be very high potency CVD. Or it could be it could be some kind of an isolate. Here's a, here's some lovely little CBD isolate powder. So any of these things you can easily measure. The thing is you have to weigh them, right? So part of the kit that we give you is this little scale. So it's a it's an inexpensive scale, but it's pretty good really, and it, it measures down to the milligram level. So when you turn on the scale, there's a calibration weight that comes with the scale. This is a 10 gram calibration weight. So we put the 10 gram calibration weight on there and this one is reading 9.989 so that's pretty close but we're not going to be weighing out anything approaching 10 grams we're going to be looking to put weigh out 100 milligrams so we want to make sure that the scale is really working at the at the 100 milligram level so to calibrate the scale at 100 milligrams or make sure the scale is calibrated at 100 milligrams take a little piece of paper towel about the size of a of a postage stamp and then take advantage of the fact that water weighs exactly one milligram per microliter and you have a hundred microliter syringe so we're going to suck up a hundred microliters of water again there's a little bubble there but I'm compensating for the bubble and then you tear the scale out so it reads zero with the paper towel on there and then you drop the hundred microliters of water onto the paper towel now the Okay, so this is reading 98. So it's within at least 2%. It's an accurate scale. But I might do that measurement again just to be sure. Last time I did it, it was 99. So uh, that's pretty close. Anyway, I'm, I'm confident that my scale is, is working properly now at the 100 milligram level. So we take one of these little plastic things called a weighing boat, and we put it on the scale like that, and then hit the tear again, and then we're going to put in a hundred milligrams of the Durban poison. So you never hit exactly a hundred milligrams. Like right there it's it's saying 105 milligrams. And that's okay because there's some place in the software where you put in the actual weight. So it doesn't really matter if it's exactly a hundred, could be ninety-five or it could be a hundred and ten. Really could be anything you like, just that we try to adjust the strength of the extract so that the, the peaks, these bumps that come out, are about the same size from the sample as they are from the calibration. So, okay. you take the little weighing boat and try not to spill any. you got to get all of it into the bottle. Now, if you had a more expensive balance that could weigh the, the bottle as well as the sample in the bottle, then you could just crumble the sample into the bottle and not have to do the weighing boat. But this little um, scale that we give you can only weigh up to 20 grams. So the bottle is 27, just a little too heavy for the scale to handle. So you have to do it this way. If you were doing an oil sample, you would do it the same way. You would take a piece of paper towel and then tear it out and then use a popsicle stick to scoop the oil onto the paper towel and then weigh that and then take the entire paper towel and put it into the bottle. So whether it's an oil sample or a flour sample doesn't really matter. It could be an edible sample, could be MCT oil or olive oil, although those are the ones that kind of cause more problems with the columns. So stick with the, the nice clean flour or the nice clean oil in the beginning until you get the hang of everything and then welcome to experiment. So. The next thing is we have to fill the bottle with the dirty solvent, right? So this is the same dirty solvent that I used to make the calibration standard, right? That's really important. Same bottle of dirty solvent. When I run out, which I'm going to do soon, I have to make a new calibration standard. So we give you this little beaker so you don't have to spill trying to pour this into the small little bottle. So you put this in the beaker and then you, you fill the bottle right up to the neck, right up to where the neck gets narrow. That's 40 milliliters of solvent. So as long as you're consistent, that's fine. So you can see already 
the acetone is turning green, which means it's extracting the chlorophyll from the, the sample. So if it's extracting the chlorophyll, it's definitely extracting the THC from all the little trichomes. But we like to let it sit for a few minutes just to be sure. Some people like to put it on a little hot plate. You can buy a nice little hot plate from Amazon that you can set to any temperature you like. Something like 40 degrees or 45 degrees is a good temperature so that it's warm. If you are doing edibles like gummy bears, you need something to heat it up because it's hard to get it to dissolve. You almost have to dissolve it in water and then add the acetone. But um, the hot plate is optional. You don't absolutely need it, but it's handy. So we're going to let that sit there for a couple of seconds while we look at the data that's occurred while we were doing that sample preparation. So you can see when we injected the calibration standard, we got the big solvent peak, which is the acetone, and then we got the methyl stearate, which is the palm oil that we put in the acetone to make it dirty. So that's the methyl stearate peak. And then this is the CBD peak. There's a little something here, which is delta-8. It always seems to occur when you buy the THC-9 standard. You always get a little delta-8 impurity. This is the delta-9 THC standard, and this is the CBN standard. And you'll notice that we have these little red lines in the middle of the screen that we call retention windows. So I can grab that window with my mouse and center it on top of the peak or I can grab the edge of the little retention window and make it narrower or wider. So the idea is that the cannabis version of our software comes with these retention windows already created, and they're all already in approximately the right place, but because there's differences from GC to GC, they're not exactly in the right place. So you have to grab your retention windows and using your best judgment, say, okay, that's the internal standard, that's the CBD, that's the Delta 9, and that's the CBN. And you'll notice they all look like they're about the same size. That's not an accident. We do that on purpose because if they are all approximately the same size, again, it's reassuring to know that we've done everything correctly. So that's the calibration standard. Now what we do is we point to the CBD and we hit calibrate CBD and then OK. And then there's a button here at the right called accept new. When we hit that button, there's a number that flows into this cell of the calibration spreadsheet. The number should be somewhere close to one if you've done everything correctly. And we do the same thing with the THC. Right click, calibrate THC, OK. Hit the accept new button, calculates a number again very close to one. And then finally with the CBN, calibrate CBN. Hit accept new, it puts a number very close to one in there. And now we're calibrated and we can go look at the answers. So we go to the results screen, which is right-click results, or it could be view results, and we get the answers. It says internal standard, the retention time, which is the time of the tippy top of the peak to come out after I hit the start button. So it took 3.6 minutes to get the internal standard peak out. The, the size of the peak is what we call the area of the peak. It's coloring in under the curve. You have to color in the area. It's not the height of the peak that matters. It's not how fat the peak that matters. It's adding up all the area under the curve without going over the line. So you, the, the software does that. That's called the process of integration, where it adds up the area under the peak. And that came out to be 1,214. And in the case of the THC, it came out to be 1174, pretty close, and then CBN, a little bit bigger, 13. Whatever it is, it is, you have to calibrate to that. So you, you go through that calibration process, and then the answer that you see here in this column should be 13.32%. So that's a little too complicated to explain how we really got from the calibration curve to the 13.32, but we'll do that in one of the next segments of this presentation. So for right now, we're going to call it quits because we've gotten the GC up and rolling. We've created a calibration standard. We've injected that into the GC. And we've also made a sample. And on the next segment of this, we'll inject the sample and see what the answer came out to be.